and Financial Times jointly developed Tech Scroll Asia in commemoration of the, the, the service. We are going to have this panel. We would like to invite panelists to the stage, so please welcome them. Let me introduce panelists for you from Preferred Network CEO, Mr. Toru Nishikawa. Make Block founder and CEO, Mr. Wan Jinju. Tokpedia founder and CEO, Mr. William Tanuvijaya. And we have moderator from Tech Scroll Asia editor, Mr. James King. Now, the floor is yours. So, uh, thank you very much indeed, and uh, welcome everybody to uh, the panel. Um, we've got about 95 minutes uh, this afternoon, and what we're going to try to do is to describe how Asian startups are changing the world. Not only the world here in Asia, but the world much more broadly. Um, let me first of all just introduce to you the structure of the panel that we have. First of all, in a minute, I will introduce the topic. Uh, then I will give you a brief introduction of Tech Scroll Asia, our very new uh, newsletter on tech trends uh, in this region. Then I will introduce our excellent panelists. Then we'll have a discussion. And finally, for about 10 or 15 minutes, I'd like to open the floor to questions from you. So as the proceedings are going ahead, please just note down anything that occurs to you, because it'll be great to have a, a, a lively discussion uh, towards the, the end of the session. Um, so let me start by just trying to frame the topic a little bit. Um, Asia, as we all know, is one of the most vibrant, if not the most vibrant, parts of the world when it comes to technology. And this is seen particularly when it comes to tech startups. Last year, according to uh, reliable sources, there was 58 billion US dollars invested in Asian tech startups. Um, that number, 58 billion US dollars, is just a little behind what was invested in the North American region. So you can see that Asia is already uh, really catching up. This year so far, the pace has roughly continued, um, but there has been one rather surprising variation. And that is that last year, the overwhelming majority of the money invested went into China. It went into China startups. But this year, the focus has shifted to Southeast Asia. Um, China has caught a bit of a chill from the US-China trade war and also from a slight slowdown in the Chinese economy. But private equity and venture capital investments into Southeast Asia have risen 10 times. Yep, you didn't mishear that. I'm saying they've risen 10 times in the first four months of this year compared to the same period a year ago. So there is a blossoming of deals being done not only in Singapore, Indonesia, Thailand, and Malaysia, which I guess you would expect, but also in places like Vietnam. Vietnam, a country of 95 million people, is becoming a real hotspot 
for tech investments. And you can see, if you look any week, there are lots of new venture capital investments going into Vietnam. Part of the reason for the interest in Vietnam is that the funds that were concentrated in China are now beginning to look towards newer markets, towards new sources of growth, and that's why they've gravitated towards Southeast Asia. Um, but even with the chill, as I said, in China, there is still an enormous amount of activity going on in the second largest economy in the world. Everybody here knows the names of Alibaba, Tencent, Didi, etc. But in my view, the more amazing trend is that there are now about 200 unicorns. So I'm sure I don't need to tell anyone here, a unicorn is a startup valued at more than a billion US dollars. Um, there are more than 200 of these unicorns in the Chinese market. So the story is not just about the big famous players, it's also about up and coming scores of up and coming companies in China that are disrupting industries um, that, that have held sway for a long time. To give you an indication of how big this trend is, let me just say that in the first quarter of this year, China created 21 new unicorns. Just as a reference, that is five times the existing number of unicorns in Singapore. And it's about twice the existing number of unicorns in the whole of Southeast Asia. So although there's a chill underway in China, China is still uh, the big story of the region. Another trend that we see is that because competition is now so fierce between private equity funds, private, uh, uh, venture capital funds, to find the next up and coming company, the next Tencent, the next Alibaba. What we're seeing is a trend whereby the money invested is moving further and further upstream. So what you see now is some of the really big players are now entering Series B, Series C financing, whereas previously they would tend to operate um, you know, towards the later stages of the funding cycle. Just to give you one example, which is close to home here in Japan, SoftBank uh, recently announced that it will uh, launch a new capital fund, a venture capital fund, called SoftBank Ventures Asia. And like everything that SoftBank does, this is a very big move. Uh, this fund has about five times the amount of money in it that a usual venture capital fund has. And this fund will be focused at the early stage funding. So in summary, if I'm to frame the topic that we're talking about today, I would say that Asia is turning into a garden of unicorns. And the amount of money chasing the next disruptive technology um, is increasing very fast indeed. So this is a trend that really will shape the region, is already shaping the region in many cases. And I'm delighted to say that we have three excellent representatives of unicorns or soon to be unicorns with us here on the panel. And I'm really looking forward to hearing their reflections as the panel goes forward. Before I introduce each of the panelists though, please give me just one minute to go through our new product called Tech Scroll Asia. You can see a copy of it on the screen. Uh, this is the English language version. Um, um, but, uh, and this is the one that we have published from the Financial Times. There is a Nikkei Asian Review version which has just been launched, and later on I believe there will be a, a, cha a Japanese language version as well. This is a joint venture between Nikkei and the Financial Times, and if you're interested in this Tech Scroll Asia newsletter, there is a desk 
just out there, um, and they would be delighted to take any questions that you have in the coffee break uh, after this session. So, as I mentioned, TechScroll Asia is a joint venture between Nikkei and the FT. It comes out once a week on Wednesday, and it aims to give the reader an overview of all of the key tech trends that are underway in the region. Every week, it's full of exclusive news, interviews with tech entrepreneurs like m the members of our panel. It's got smart data on investment trends. Um, it's got analysis on where the next disruption is coming from. And uh, it's got links to other sources of expert comment uh, um, from around the world. I'm just scrolling through it now. You can see here, Mercedes top 10, this is what we regard as the 10 most important tech stories from the region this week. Uh, this section, when sages speak, this is where we bring in um, some of the thought leaders in tech from anywhere around the world, whether it be Asia, the US, or, or, or Europe, and uh, we provide links to their work. Here we've got one of our famous columnists on tech, uh, Henny Sender, is like a scoop machine. She's constantly getting fascinating new types of information. Um, and in, in this section here, in the spotlight, we've got, you know, an interesting uh, take on tech. This is a, uh, a, like a dating uh, company. Smart data shows various trends, et cetera. So you can see, that uh, that's what the product looks like. But it, the key thing is that it links through to the stories that may be published on the Nikkei Asian Review or may be published in the Financial Times. Um, and of course, it covers many of the Japanese companies, um, both in terms of what they're doing here in Japan, but also in terms of their investments into the region. And I left the best thing about Tech Scroll Asia till last to tell you, and that is that it is free. Um, and uh, if you just, if you're a subscriber to Nikkei Asian Review or the Financial Times, all you need to do is register. And as I said, all of the details are out there um, in the hall um, at a desk over there. So now. Let me turn to the panel and uh, briefly introduce each of our panelists before we start with uh, our dialogue. Um, at the far end is uh, William Tanuwijaya. He's the founder and CEO of Tokopedia. Um, I'm sure many of you will have heard of this company. It is Indonesia's biggest online mall. The company has attracted investments from SoftBank Vision Fund here in Japan and from Alibaba. So it's backed by some seriously major players and several other investors as well. Um, this puts the valuation of Tokopedia at about 7 billion US dollars. So already it's not a small company by any means. Uh, the company is doing very interesting things particularly in terms of, you, of using artificial intelligence to create ways to overcome the huge logistical challenges that exist in the Indonesian market. And that's because Indonesia is a country of 17,000 islands spread over about 5,000 kilometers. So we're very much looking forward to uh, hearing William talking about how you overcome those challenges in a minute. Uh, next to William is Jason Wang, uh, founder and CEO of MakeBlock. MakeBlock is a Chinese company famous for allowing kids to make their own robots. I mean, when I was a kid, there was you couldn't dream of making your own robot. But these days, the technology exists and is already, already making a splash here in Japan. Uh, I've read that there's a school in Tokyo where children of 10 years old, 11 years old, are already making their own robot and writing the code that tells the robot how to move or, or, or what acts to perform. 
Another interesting thing about Makeblock is that it does 70% of its business outside China. So here in Japan, in the US, and in Europe. And so far, if my numbers are correct, and if I'm, if I'm not, then Jason will correct me in a minute, this technology has entered about 20,000 schools around the world. Uh, and next to me here uh, is Toro Nishikawa-san. Uh, he is the president and CEO of Preferred Networks. I think this is a company that will be known to many of you in this room. It's already very famous in Japan. Um, it's a specialist in deep learning. So this is a type of technology where the computer or the application mimics the functions of the human brain. And one application that uh, the preferred networks robots can perform is to, it can alter the tasks on the production line so that if the robot next to uh, the preferred net network's robot breaks down, this robot can step in to learn the tasks that that robot performs in order to replace it. Preferred Networks is also uh, one of Japan's most highly valued tech startups, and it has tie-ups with famous companies such as Hitachi and Fanuc. Uh, in terms of investors, Preferred Networks is invested in by Toyota, and I believe the company is developing an autonomous uh, a car or an autonomous vehicle uh, with Toyota. So um, let me start by asking uh, Nishikawa-san to um, um, present a little bit about preferred networks before we move on to the other panelists. Thank you very much for the introduction. This is Nishikawa from Preferred Networks. So our company uh, specializes in deep learning, and we are attempting to apply our deep learning technology on a global basis. It could be automated driving, life science, more recently energy and chemical. These are the areas that we are applying. So I'd like to share with you some videos as to what we are doing so you can have uh, a sense of our business. What we are focusing is robotics. So we have collaborated with uh, FANAC. So this is the most advanced industrial robotics. And we have been applying the deep learning to this application. We started from there. And since then, we have been exploring the possibility of uh, using AI and deep learning and robotics. So last year, we have launched the personal robots. We are also uh, attempting to use our technology. So last year, uh, we have exhibited to the event. And this is the video I'm going to show you. So it's one of the robots we developed is a cleanup robot. So of course, you might know some of the, uh, uh, the, the small uh, robot and uh, that would actually clean up the floor. But of course, in order for the robots to operate, you need to clean up everything on the floor. But of course, if you want to be used in household, it would be nice to have a robot that would actually pick up all the unnecessary stuff, tidy up the room first. So uh, that is the reason why we developed this robot. So the robot, uh, which are HSR, is the uh, Toyota's robot that we use. And so we apply our recognition technology. And also, we have the robots to uh, give instructions through gestures. By doing so, we can really tidy up the, uh, the room. So let's just say if you're away from home. And while you're away, they would just automatically clean up your room. And by the time you come back, it is nice and clean. So this is the kind of technology we are developing. So as you can see from this video, this is just a demonstration. And so in fact, last year, for four days, last year, excuse me, for four days, we uh, demonstrated this robot. So you might have seen the robot's demonstration through video such as this, but perhaps not as often to see it uh, with your own hand, uh, with your own eyes, because for videos, you can just shoot wherever it was successful. But if you're seeing it in a real-time basis, of course, uh, you would see robots operating all the time. Sometimes they may fail. Uh, so we made sure that that would not happen. 
that robots would be close to perfection uh, in the course of four days, and we were able to exhibit that. Now, some of the key technology here uh, was in the deep technology. This is the recognition uh, technology. So the eye uh, function has become much smarter, much higher in precision, so they can grasp the objects quite accurately. So let's just say if you're uh, gri gripping the, uh, uh, the pet bottles, of course, you need to identify the shape of the bottles. Otherwise, we will not be able to catch it uh, accurately. So it is very important to recognize the object first. Now this recognition technology is rapidly advancing, especially in the automated driving area. So uh, uh, we are seeing much need for the application, and we are seeing much R&D money in here. So by making use of this technology, we can have an accurate smart eyes to the robots. And by doing so, this uh, cleanup activities, so robots, it is really difficult for them to catch and grasp the objects. But we are very close to uh, commercialization, or we are very close to making it into a practical technology. So through this technology and through development of robotics, we like to make robots more of a familiar uh, presence. That is the kind of world we like to develop. This is a little different from what I have just explained. This is a demonstration. You see, this person's character's facial expression, this is generated automatically by machine from zero, from scratch. So if someone uh, is writing a contour or giving the color, it's not the case. Deep learning models actually creates these characters from the scratch. Creative business is one of the business we do, like painting the picture or creating animations and producing animations, and that's what we do as well. By utilizing deep learning, creative activities can be supported as well or assisted as well. You may know the animation industry is quite tough to be in. You have to have a lot of labor to actually uh, work uh, to create animation films, but it's hardly ever possible to have a big hit animation films. I'm a fan of animation, and my uh, members are quite a lot of fans of animation. So we wanted to make some contribution to the animation industry. So by creating this kind of creative assistant uh, uh, kind of uh, robots, so we thought those who are in animation industry can do a repetitive work uh, by um, the, uh, assigned to the robots so that uh, they can use their brain more creative work. And that's what we utilize deep learning for in animation industry. And the third item, this is something we have been doing from the very beginning, that is life science. Biological uh, cancers or any uh, phenomena uh, is uh, caused by errors contained in genomes. And because of the error uh, embedded in the gene, gene and the genomes, the cancer occurs. So this is a very complicated phenomenon. But uh, we are not able to identify the reasons by using just uh, experimental tools. So we wanted to take on this complicated uh, biological phenomena by utilizing computing resource and uh, deep learning methodology, which is excellent to identify and find solutions for very difficult problems to be solved. One thing we are working with is the cancer diagnosis. Diagnosing cancer, you think of uh, image diagnosis that is actually now being uh, taught for uh, AI. However, our approach is to find uh, blood microRNA by uh, analyzing uh, the microRNA in the blood, we make decision whether this person is cancer or not cancer. And that's a repetition of work that uh, deep learning is done. Uh, we are working with the National Cancer Center from the very beginning, and we are very much closer to the commercialization of this technology. So diagnostic technology uh, is something that we are working with our partners, both in Japan and US. And also, we want to do this business overseas, not just in the US market and elsewhere. We are trying to commercialize this currently. 
deep learnings can find a lot of place to be implemented, for example, in the area of chemicals and uh, energy. Deep learning possibilities can be utilized in different types of application. Our company's biggest uh, differences from the other is that we are doing research into AI, but we don't stop there. AI and uh, domain that is uh, quite fitted with AI. We also do some research into the expert domains that can work with AI very well so that we can combine these into a very nice way. And we are good at doing that. So we are headquarters somewhere near here. And we have machine tools on the uh, ground floor of our offices. And Finax sometimes ask me or th uh, said to me, Probably the machine we have in our basement is the most advanced machine that is actually uh, uh, located or installed in the downtown Tokyo. But anyway, we have that kind of machines and have our engineers used to so that the engineer can acquire domain knowledge, not just deep learning knowledge, so that we can do business overseas. And this is our basis for our product commercialization. Thank you. Nishikawa-san, thank you so much. Um, very interesting. I've got a, a couple of questions. I was very struck by the brilliant um, idea of the tidy up robot. Um, I can think of plenty of rooms in my own house that could use a bit of, uh, of, of that robot's help. But could you start off by telling us, you know, how does the robot know um, what is rubbish and what is not rubbish? I mean, how does it know not to pick up your passport or your car keys and throw them in the bin? Um, that's, that's my first question. Well, basically speaking, vast amount of data should be learned by the robot first. Hundreds and a thousand different types of items should be identified and the robots to be able to instantaneously make decisions as to whether this is important and not important. And we made sure that the robot can actually receive command. So if we give them command to throw away, then the robot will throw away. But if a robot is not certain, like whether this is a passport or not, a pencil or not, that should be kept, then the robot would ask me whether this can be thrown away or not. And if I give him or a robot instruction, then the robot will uh, throw away, and that will continue on. The uh, recognition is one uh, that is quite important, but also we are able to give the robot the command in a very easy uh, to do manner is another important feature. Gave you the idea of developing this. I mean, uh, is this the first in the world to be able to do this? Well, this tidying up robot um, I have never seen a similar robots in the world, even on the video basis. We wanted to deploy personal robots in the society, but to do that, we have to show robots are useful for people. And when I think about that, because I had to tidy up my room, I thought uh, maybe someone should do this, and that's something Robert can do. Already? or uh, And uh, if so, how much are you selling one of these for? And can I take one back to Hong Kong? <laughs> <laughs> well, unfortunately, this is not commercialized yet. This is not a product. But if within a few years' time, we have a plan to commercialize. We are working on it. Robot part is quite expensive. so. Uh, how much we can reduce the price is a challenge that we are developing. Do you know roughly when it might be on the market? I mean, are we talking like next year, the year after? Maybe a year after or maybe three, four years. Within that time span, we would like to commercialize. Within one or two years, prob probably prices would be much higher. Question on the uh, commercialization of the early detection of cancer. I mean, obviously, that seems to have enormous applications around the world. You said you're close to commercialization. Could you give us a few more details on that? So this well, 
Currently, uh, we are at the phase of establishing laboratories. We do establish uh, basic technology, so we have to collect samples into that laboratory to carry out testing, and that's where we are. So we have to invest in uh, testing equipment, um, and also we need to apply for government approval to do this. We should be able to do faster uh, than uh, robots of tidying up in uh, commercialization. Move on to uh, Jason. Is um, when you do this research, are you mostly doing it with your partners, um, you know, Toyota or Fanuc or, or companies like that, or are you just doing it within preferred networks? For cancer research, most of uh, is done by ourselves, but we are working with National Cancer Center and also DNA in Japan and uh, Mitsui and company in the United States. We form partnership. And for personal robot, uh, Toyota's robot was a part of the uh, Tidy Up robot. So that part is coming from Toyota, but all the other technologies uh, we actually develop. Very interesting. So, uh, Jason, uh, moving on to you, please. Um, uh, I think you've you, you've got a, a small presentation to share with us, and then perhaps I could follow up some questions after that. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, it's my honor to be here to talk about the uh, Asia startups uh, uh, in this panel. So, first, I I will make a brief introduction of my company. So, we are based in Shenzhen, China, which is a kind of factory, what factory? Uh, in, in China, uh, you know. And uh, so this is uh, some basic numbers of uh, our company. Uh, we have uh, four um, uh, uh, sub in US, in Hong Kong, in Japan, and the uh, Netherlands. So our product have sold to about 140 countries. Uh, over 70% of our sales is from outside of China. But uh, this number, I think in the, our domestic sales, we uh, uh, increased to 50% this year. And uh, we have about uh, 2,000 partners around the world. And uh, we, our product have entered in about more than 25,000 schools. And uh, we have more than 800 million, uh, 8 million users around the world. So, um, 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 our company is doing uh, is providing uh, STEAM education solution, which is include uh, hardware, that's robotics, some uh, some robotics, some sensors, uh, me mechanical components for for schools, and uh, also software like uh, some uh, graphic programming sof software for kids to learn programming, and uh, we also provide like uh, 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 content, so uh, courses. And, uh, and also we hold a competition, it's called a Make As Competition. So this is our solution. Uh, we started in the year 2012. So in the very beginning, it was only myself and um, uh, one person. And uh, then in the 2013, I joined an uh, incubator called Hex, which I think which is, uh, now Hex is one of the biggest uh, incubator focus in uh, hardware company, and uh, and then in uh, in 2014 uh, we uh, uh, so after that we started to receive like um, uh, angel investment from Chinese company from Square Capital China, and uh, recently we just finished our round C uh, fundraising which is about uh, five fifty million US dollars, so. Uh, the products we provide to schools is uh, uh, to uh, help schools to uh, um, uh, make uh, STEAM education. So it's not a, it's not a to teach. It's not only to teach students to learn technology, but to uh, teach uh, students how to solve problems, how to create new things uh, with the new technology. So many schools in the in the world are realized that uh, our education need to change. So. In the past 50 years, I think uh, our society changed a lot. The technology uh, changed our lives so much. But uh, in education area, we didn't see so much change. So not only in China, but also in many other countries, like in America, in Europe, in Japan. So many countries are realize the importance of the 
of the change of the education. So we think that the, the change of the education is the STEAM education. We need to uh, help our students to learn more new technology uh, to, uh, to help them to so, um, uh, better solve problems and uh, uh, create for their creativity. So, um, so this is uh, our solution for schools. Like first is in, inside the classroom. For classroom, we have robots that are suitable for teachers to use to teach uh, students coding, coding with the hardware. So in the, we, our solution cover from kindergarten to uh, high schools. So in the kindergarten, our robots, the robots can uh, uh, teach uh, logical thinking, but we, without a screen, the um, students don't need to learn complex software. They just uh, uh, use some card to uh, uh, program in the robot. And uh, for primary schools, they started to using uh, programming software, graphic programming software like Scratch. And uh, together with uh, hardware and the software all together to, to learn robotics and uh, uh, programming. And uh, in, the, in, in the middle school, we have a kind of a develop board for them to learn some new technology like AI, IoT, so the, uh, we have a board called Hello Code, it can build, has a built-in Wi-Fi and, uh, and the Bluetooth, and uh, it's possible for them to use the latest technology like AI, like tech, uh, IoT to, uh, uh, for, the, for their creativity. So that's in the classroom. So uh, out, of, out of the classroom, some schools may have the needs. They, they may want to build a make space, or they, uh, they, uh, they need to build a robotics lab for some students to uh, uh, freely create uh, something. So when, uh, when they, uh, they want to build this kind of space, they need the solutions like in three sides, so mechanicals, electronics, and uh, software. So we provide a wide solution this, in these three areas. The first is, uh, uh, so in the very beginning, we, uh, we manufacture, we produce uh, some metal parts, some aluminum parts for them to make some very professional robots. So this, uh, right now, this platform, we have about more than 500 kinds of mechanical parts, electronic sensors, for them to build very professional robots using uh, aluminum parts. And, uh, but I think only aluminum is not enough. Some other materials, like, like cardboard, like wood, may be uh, needed to uh, uh, import in, in their uh, creativity. So, um, we also use cardboard and, uh, and wood in provide them to create some things. And, um, and we also have uh, some solutions on using other materials like uh, plastic. So we have a, a kit, we have a, a product line that are using uh, plastic for them to build uh, some uh, professional robots. And, uh, but uh, uh, we think this is not enough because uh, all, all these solutions is uh, only modules that uh, uh, we give to the customers. But we think if the customers they want to be more have more freedom to create, they need some kind of tools. So we uh, developed a laser cutting machines, a very user friendly laser cutting machines, and it's much smaller than the traditional laser cutting machines, and uh, it's much safe and. Uh, very easy to use with the uh, with some of the AI technology like uh, 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 computer vision, yeah. So uh, so this is uh, on the mechanical side. We want to provide a wide range of choice for customers to, cho to choose. So on the on the electronic side, we also provide uh, uh, some very easy to use electronic modules for the for them to create and. Uh, but we, we don't stop here. And uh, recently, we uh, launched our new product called, it's called a Neuron. So it's uh, much more easy to use. We use some mechanic uh, connector to so make it very easy to, to connect. So for users who don't have any uh, technology background, they can use uh, this kind of sensor so to create something. So this on the uh, electronic side. And uh, on the software side, um, we, uh, we are using Scratch, which is from MIT. So this is one of the most popular graphic programming language uh, in the world. We, um, 
So this is our first uh, step, and then we uh, we combine Scratch with Python. When so when the, the students they uh, they become uh, more experienced with the uh, graphic. Uh, graphic programming, they may need some uh, professional tool. So we uh, introduce Python to them. So we combine uh, Python and uh, Scratch together. And uh, we also uh, developed a new way to, for them to uh, programming, this is, which is, uh, uh, we call it a flow-based uh, programming, which is it's only needed to drag on the job. And uh, then they can make their own pro program. So it's very intuitive for them to realize the, the ideas. So this is uh, what MakeBook doing. So we um, actually our vision is to want to help people to realize the ideas in the physical world. So nowadays it's very easy for us to realize our ideas in the digital world. We can make we can make pictures, make videos. We can create 3D models in the digital world. We can nearly do everything in the digital world. But uh, when we come to the physical world, for example, if you, you need to make a very simple robot to take a bottle of water to you, this seems like a very simple task. But uh, this is uh, very hard for many people to do these ideas by themselves. So what MakeBlock make want to do is to help people to realize the ideas in the, in the physical world and to help students to, to learn robotics, learn uh, uh, programming. Uh, we, we want to encourage them to use this technology to, uh, to create new things, to help them um, realize their creativity. And um, not only uh, products that we, we make, we also uh, hold a competition called Make Us Competition, which we just started in the year 2017. So in the first year, we only have about 300 teams, and uh, only hold in, in, in the mainland of China, one country. And, uh, but uh, uh, in the next year, we, uh, in the two, 2018, we have about uh, more than 3,000 teams. And uh, there are more than 20 countries, uh, teams from 20 countries join this competition. And uh, in this year, I think we will have more than 10,000 teams join this competition, which is from, eight, from more than 60 countries. And uh, so MakeUs competition is now becoming one of the famous uh, uh, robotics competition in K-12 uh, uh, period. And uh, um, so this is, this is what is the, the main two part of what we are doing. So we provide um, a wide range of hardware and software for schools to start STEAM education. In the same time, we provide a, a very uh, good platform for them to evaluate what the uh, children's learning. That, this is a make as competition. And uh, here is a short video of uh, the, this make as. Okay, thanks. That's my introduction. Thank you, Jason. That was a that was a great video. Are you? Uh, a, do you remember which was the winner of the world championship? There. I mean, at the end, it says there's a world championship. So. You mean last year? Yeah. I think it's. Uh, it's uh, I think it's a Chinese team. Uh -huh. Yeah, but we have two. It's a it's a alliance. So we have two two teams uh, for championship. I think one is a Chinese team, but the alliance I think is from from other country. Right. And what was the robot that they made? Uh, so we, we have a task for them. So they need to build the robot and to finish the task. And the, the, in Make Heads competition, we have different games. So Make Heads Starter, Make Heads Challenge, Premier. So uh, it's, uh, in the high end, it's, uh, it's much hard. So they need to build a robot like to collect the balls and to hit the, hit the uh, other, other Compliments. Yeah. Oh, yeah. so the robot needs to pick up a what, like a tennis ball or something? Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. And throw it to hit another robot. Yeah, 
Yeah, okay. it's not a tennis ball. It's a, it's a very uh, softer ball. Softer than that. Yeah, so yeah. the robot doesn't get broken. Yeah. yeah. I see. Wow. And uh, you found some kids who were able to build that robot? Uh, what? Some, uh, I mean, how old were the, were, were the students that managed to build a robot like that? Uh, so for different games, we uh, cover different ages. So for Make a Starter, I think the age is from, start from six, six to 13. But for Make as a Challenge, I think it's uh, uh, start from, uh, uh, I think start from 13 to uh, uh, 15, maybe, mm -hmm. yeah. I see. So um, I also understand that you quite often go to schools in China, and you mentioned you're in 25,000 schools around the world, I think, yes. right? Um, when you go to those schools, what do the students really like to build most? I mean, what kind of robot do they, do they all try to build? Um, so uh, actually, with our platform, they, uh, they can build nearly anything. In, uh, in their mind. So this depends on their mind. This depends on, on teachers' uh, teachers' guidance. So most of the, yeah, most of the students, they want to build some fighting robot. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, especially boys. It doesn't surprise me, yeah, right, yeah. right. I see. And so does uh, MakeBlock sometimes look at the robots that are being built, either in these competitions or maybe some of the schools you go to and think, wow, that's a really clever idea. You could make that commercially, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. There's um, uh, so we have a community that uh, uh, a lot of our users they will share their ideas, share their uh, what they they have done, and uh, we do have some uh, inspiration from them and uh, put them in our products. Right. Like, can you give an example? Um, so we uh, we have like um, uh, how to say so we, we have a product called the ultimate uh, or ultimate robot kit. So mm. it, it we have ten ten shapes of the of the kit that can build. Some shape is from the community. Right, I see. Okay, so no um, massive products yet that you found that's been designed by the children and you're now selling commercially. Uh, not yet. But, okay, in the future, maybe. Yeah, yeah, in the future, maybe. Uh, the, the, the other question I wanted to ask you was, um, I read somewhere, I don't know if this is accurate, that the way MakeBlock started to raise finance was on Kickstarter uh, in the U.S. Could you just tell us that story a little bit, please? Yes, so that's before our angel currently funding, and uh, uh, that's before our angel invest investment. And uh, so at that, that time, so we uh, actually, we, we have problems on selling our product because we are a very small team. Our market is outside China. We don't have the channels. So uh, finally, the hacks suggest us to uh, launch our project on Kickstarter. And um, we just tried it and it's uh, successful. So actually we are the first one, first company in China to launch our product on Kickstarter. And we make about one million uh, RMB. So this is a, not a big number today, but uh, in six years ago, it's a big number. And uh, so, uh, because a lot of makers like this, this is what they want. Yeah. This is what they need. And um, so after that, because the, we got success on Kickstarter, so some media, some Chinese media, started to report us, and this make us a little famous in, in Chinese VC, uh, a lot of Chinese VC know us, and then it helps us to raise our angel uh, funding. And um, the, I, I think the, the key is that Kickstarter is a, a US company, right? So if yeah. you're based in China, you wouldn't normally be able to raise money on Kickstarter. So how did you manage to do it? Actually, uh, so Kickstarter, uh, allows American people to launch a project. Not only, uh, it's, um, uh, so not limit in, in your uh, location. So at that time, my team have uh, American people. So we, uh, we use his uh, ID to launch the project. Okay, okay. Yeah. And then your fame began to grow after that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah okay. And um, I mean, do you have any, any particular robot that you, um, that you do you like best? I mean, what's your coolest uh, product? Uh, the coolest product is not showing in this in my slides, but it's um, 
yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a drone, you know. Um, it's a transformable drone. It can can change it to a, to a hovercraft, so it can fly and it can also drive on the ground or on the water. Yeah, this is because I uh, actually I learned aircraft design in my universities, so I always have the dream to build a drone like this. And uh, and when I got that idea, so actually this is not very related to steam medication. Actually, it's uh, it's more about my own interest. Right, yeah. I see, I see. And um, and last question um, before we move on. Um, it, it seems that you know you've got some uh, competitors coming up like Lego and Wonder Workshop, and I think Sony here has got something called K O O V Couve, right? Yeah, yeah. So how do you stay ahead of those guys? How what's your kind of from from a business planning point of view? How are you planning to keep ahead? Yeah, people. So people are saying that uh, we are the 21st century's Lego. Yeah, Lego is inviting in 20th century. So actually, we based in China. We are uh, we have very good supply chain there. So we have about more than 200 you know, uh, engineers, and we have very good supply chain. So this help us to keep very fast speed on new product development. Yeah. So right now we have about six product lines not as skills, so six product lines, different shape of product. And uh, compared to some competitors like in the, in the US, like in like Wonder Workshop or, or uh, LittleBiz, this company, uh, they come out the, the same, I think it's nearly the same time as we uh, established. But right now, they, all, they, they only have one or two product lines, but we have more than six. So I think it's, uh, uh, it's because we spend a lot of effort on R&D and we have a supply chain, so we can uh, quickly move on product, new product lease. Yeah, this is very important. And uh, we, uh, we are 100% focusing on uh, education. I think that's, so for Lego, it's actually it's a toy company. So education, I think, is kind of only part of their business. Okay, just, just, just one uh, quick follow-up before we move on uh, to William. I mean, you, you mentioned that you know, part of the aspect of, of this product is that you have 10-year-old, um, 11-year-old children writing code. Yes. How difficult is it to write code like that? Seems to me, but I'm from a different generation, seems to me quite difficult. Yeah, so yeah, nowadays people think about coding is like, yeah. <laughs> Uh, coding on, on the keyboard, but uh, nowadays we, we have very good uh, tool for uh, it's called graphic programming. Yeah, it's, you, so all the all the you don't need to write any code. You just uh, drag and drop the the blocks, and uh, you uh, and uh, that that's the process to make the programming. So it's very easy. It's uh, this tool is invented by MIT. I think. Uh, more than 10 years ago, so this is widely used in many schools. So it's uh, it's uh, uh, so many schools in uh, in in the world are, are learning coding worldwide. Right. Yeah, right. they and, can learn. Yeah. And how excited do the kids get when they see you know their robots start to move? I think this will make them very excited. You know, so before with the computer, they only they can only play games like. All, all write some words. This is what they can do before. But nowadays, they can create, they can realize their ideas. They can think about, okay, I have this idea, and they use the tools. They can realize these ideas. This makes them very excited. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, so, William, uh, moving on to you. I, I mentioned that Tokopedia uh, is already very well known in this region, um, Indonesia's biggest online mall. Uh, could you give us a few more details, and then I can uh, follow up with a few questions. Thank you, James, for having me. Good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, been an honor and pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is William. I'm a founder and CEO of Tokopedia. Ten years ago, we started Tokopedia with a mission to democratize commerce through technology. So Indonesia has 17,000 islands. This is very challenging for Indonesia to build equal infrastructure across the country. So I come from a very small city, my hometown in uh, North Sumatra. It is at the west uh, of Indonesia. Until today, in my hometown, there is no shopping mall. So people in my hometown have a very limited access to goods. And when if, even they have access to the goods, for a bottle of water, 
that people can enjoy in a big city or like capital city in Jakarta, then the price is actually much higher in a small city. And my parents saved their whole life so they can send me to a bigger city to have a better education and a better opportunity. So this is actually a vicious cycle. People need to move to a bigger city for better education, better opportunity. And the people that already moved to big city rarely back to the small city to develop the uh, rural part of the Indonesia. So 10 years ago, we believe that technology should be a solution of this. How we can actually using technology as infrastructure to build equal opportunity for everyone. We imagine that one day every individual in Indonesia will have the same opportunity. They can start and grow their business everywhere in Indonesia and have access to the whole country. We imagine that one day every Indonesian will, no matter where they live, will have access to any goods and uh, they just need to pay similar price with the people in a big city. So fast forward 10 years, Tokopedia today, uh, starting from two people, growing to become 4,200 employees. We call it Nakama in Tokopedia. So we are growing strong 4,200 Nakama. Every month we are already serving about 90 million monthly active users that represent one out of three Indonesian population. We are already reaching and are having a transaction in a 97% district in Indonesia. So the remaining 3% is a, a area where there's a still no road, there's a still no internet, and we hope that one day uh, with the government support building infrastructure in this 3% uh, of the part of the Indonesia, one day we can reach 100% district in Indonesia. And uh, we are already helping 5.5 million people starting and growing their business in Tokopedia. And surprisingly, 70% of them are first-time entrepreneur, stay-at-home mom, colleague student, office worker, that dreams to become entrepreneurs. Now they can start with Tokopedia and have basically no barrier of entry to uh, grow their business to uh, um, nationwide in Indonesia. And Indonesia is a country where 60, 70% of economy is driven by a small businesses, 60 million of small businesses. If you see here, 5.5 million per, uh, merchants, 70% new entrepreneurs, meaning that it's only about 1 million merchants from traditional businesses move to our platform. There's a still big opportunity to uh, uh, achieve a traditional business to uh, our platform. And as well, um, it is amazing to see how many new entrepreneurs actually rise in the platform like Tokopedia in an emerging country like Indonesia. This August, Tokopedia will celebrate our 10 years anniversary. And uh, the first 10 years, we are a technology company that help other people to do e-commerce. We are not e-commerce company. We are not selling any product by our own. Every single product in Tokopedia is uh, someone uh, businesses. So stay-at-home mom, colleague, student, small business, everyone in the past 10 years can be a very good and decent e-commerce company because of Tokopedia. We are a technology company that allow them to do so. For the next 10 years, we imagine that we want to become a technology company. This is our vision for the next 10 years. A technology company that help other people to become technology company. What does it mean? This start from my own observation. My uncle in my hometown is still running a traditional pop and mom store. He's a, from older generation and he doesn't want to be an online merchant. So I realized that a lot of traditional businesses actually doesn't want to become uh, online businesses. And it is okay. But uh, the challenge of them is like they are f growing in a very competitive landscape. They need to compete with uh, modern retail like 7-Eleven type. And the margin of uh, doing business in Indonesia in a rural part because of the distribution network is a very expensive. They get a very small margin while the customer paid um, a higher price because of the inefficiency of distribution. So if like we can help any traditional store to using technology, still serving offline customer, but in a more, much more eff effective way. For example, redefining how they supply chain using technology. Then we can help any businesses to become a technology company. If we can help farmer, fishermen, to actually do the consumer to businesses model. This is our dream for the next 10 years. Not everyone need to become e-commerce company. Everyone can use technology 
to transform them and to make their business more effective and efficient so the customer and the businesses have a win-win solution. So the past 10 years, we see the evolution where when we started uh, Tokopedia 10 years ago in Indonesia, it's all about PC and desktop. From the internet, it transformed to become a mobile first in the past three to four years. And today, it's an evo evolution changing again. From the mobile first, it's already become AI first. So the next 10 years, we believe that AI first co company will, will, will transform the world to become a better place. One of our core philosophy is uh, we believe that the world become more open and uh, we should building bridges, not uh, walls. We believe that in order to become successful, we, can, we need to help other people to become successful. Like in Tokopedia, that is our core philosophy. We believe that in order to do so, then we are running the most beautiful business model in the world. So we are always trying to see technology not as a disruptor. We see technology as an empowerment and enablement. And I give example, one of the electricity is, uh, one of the example of technology is electricity. But uh, we, we never heard anyone, our friends, family that say that I lost my job, I running out of businesses because of electricity. But today I think in a different part of the world, in emerging market, you still hear people so afraid about the new technology. They are wonder that the mobile internet because of that, I lost my job. Because of mobile internet, my parents running out of businesses. I think it is our responsibility as a technology company to transform technology to become easy to use and uh, understand um, uh, uh, tools. So every individual will see mobile internet, AI, robotic, whatever evolution of technology as a tools like electricity that is a very empowerment and enablement tools that help life to become easier, convenient, and a businesses to become more effective and efficient. So we are much look forward for the next 10 years of evolution of Tokopedia, and uh, uh, thank you for having me. Thank you. Um, so uh, just, just quickly to follow up, um, I, uh, I, I heard that there was an interesting story uh, with Tokopedia in one of your early or, or fairly early fundraising rounds. Um, in fact, it was the one that uh, concerned SoftBank. Um, and you had to come to Japan. Uh, could you just tell us uh, that story a little bit, please? Yeah, so I always, um, so um, from very far in Indonesia, I idolize uh, the founder of SoftBank, Masayoshi Son. The reason being is like, SoftBank is founded in 1981. I was born in 1981. And uh, on my 30 years old, I watched a YouTube video and I witnessed uh, Son San is uh, sharing his um, speech in the SoftBank 30 years anniversary about his 300 years vision. And that's really amazed me that um, uh, founders having a so f looking forward vision. And I promised myself that this is the type of company that I want to build, a company that long lasts me. So I always have a dream to meet with uh, Son San. And one day in the summer of um, 2014, my uh, wife at that time is uh, asking me to go to Japan for holiday by uh, the October. Um, but the problem is like Tokopedia only have runway to run the company if like we fail to raise capital because at that time Tokopedia is not profitable yet. We will need to close the business by November. November is our runway, November 2014. So I say to my wife that I cannot uh, go. I need to uh, focus on my businesses. So I suggest she go with her friends. But then I thought that I already have a relationship with her for seven years. So I actually secretly asked her parents to um, quietly follow her because I want to propose to her. So I'll take a very short break. Propose uh, for marriage? Propose for marriage. So she want to go to um, uh, uh, Osaka. Um, so surprisingly, in uh, so I plan everything. I supposed to uh, do my um, uh, proposal on the first of October, two thousand fourteen, and uh, surprisingly, by end of September two thousand fourteen, I got a call from uh, Sobang headquarters. They asked me if like, I can meet with Sonsan by the second of October. 
but the invitation is coming only four days before the meeting. And uh, this, I think, is a serendipity or luck, because from Indonesia, you really need to apply visa to come to Japan. And the visa process is like five working days at least. <laughs> right, so um, when the invitation is uh, to meet with Sonsan on the 2nd of October, I already will be in uh, uh, Osaka by the 1st of October. <laughs> so I can immediately say, yes, I can meet with uh, uh, Sonsan on the 2nd of October. On the day before I uh, go to uh, Osaka on the, the 30th of October, my early investors, which is Japanese investor, Sato-san from Binex, called me. And he said that, William, are you in Jakarta? I said, that, yes, I'm in Jakarta. He said that Sequoia Capital Managing uh, uh, Partners is in town. Can you meet with him for one hour? I met him uh, from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. And then by the evening, when I'm on the way to airport, I got a call from Sequoia Capital as well, and again, and he asked me if I can spend, spend more time with them on the, tomorrow, the 1st of October. I said that I'm on the way to airport. He, he asked me where you will go to. I said that I'll go to Osaka. The moment that I landed on Osaka on the 1st October morning, Sequoia Capital Venture Partner is already waiting me in Osaka airport. <laughs> so he's occupied me until 5 p.m. By 5 p.m. I'm saying that I, I, I need to terminate this, I mean to finish this meeting because I'm about to, to propose to uh, my wife. <laughs> this is the first time I'm in Osaka, I don't know where to buy a flower and so on. So by 7 p.m. I managed to meet with my wife um, and uh, I proposed to her, she's very happy, she said yes. And then I said to her that now I need to fly to Tokyo. <laughs> On the 2nd October, I met with Son San, and then um, that is, the, I think, the most important week on, on my life <laughs> because that week I got three different proposals and hope, uh, luckily, everyone say yes. Oh, fantastic. So you made one proposal and then you got three proposals in yeah, two, return. Two, two proposals. proposals in return, I see. Fantastic. What a great story. Um, so did that happen during your your star sign? I mean, uh, is October, were you born in October? Were you a no, I actually born in November. So, oh, um, okay. so my I'm destiny at that time is like the company will either start down on November or we find uh, new investors that support the company. And uh, that 100 million actually taking uh, Tokopedia to the next level. Really, yeah, yeah, I, I'm, I'm sure. And can you talk a little bit also about Alibaba? Uh, they're also an investor in Tokopedia. How helpful have they been? So I always admire um, Alibaba philosophy on, uh, they are also pure marketplace that do not compete with their merchants. They are helping small businesses to grow in on the top of their platform. And um, also I witnessed from the far, used to be people called Alibaba as a copycat of eBay. Um, and this is early days. And uh, Jack Ma has this philosophy, he said that when uh, people ask him, how, it's uh, impossible, they call him Crazy Jack, it's impossible to compete with eBay. eBay at that time is acquiring the leading uh, uh, C2C platform in China. And uh, Jack said, eBay is like shark in the ocean, and uh, Alibaba is like crocodile in the youngster. And if like shark compete with crocodile in the ocean, shark will win. But if they compete in the river, then uh, crocodile is supposed to win. So that, I think, Son San Jack is a type of founders that I admire because business model changes, technology changes, but they run their company with a wisdom, with a philosophy. They are putting a very deep philosophy on how they see the world. And on Tokopedia, early days, we don't have capital, we don't have the technology, we don't have know-how. We start with two people in emerging market like Indonesia. We also need to compete with eBay, and then second year with Rakuten. It's all global giants. And even eventually we need to compete with Alibaba as well, because Alibaba acquired uh, at the time uh, the leading um, uh, regional e-commerce platform, uh, uh, Lazada. That, that year, I actually, uh, that, day, that day when Alibaba acquired Lazada, I sent a letters to all my nakama. I said that, walk until your idols become your rivals. Hmm. We actually took pride of that. And I actually took uh, Jack philosophy and I said that we are very fortunate and unfortunate to live in Indonesia with 17,000 island. All our river is already surrounded by a global crocodile. <laughs> All our ocean is also already uh, occupied by globalization. So, so our only chance is to become Komodo in this 17,000 island. <laughs> so if we fight as a Komodo in the 17,000 island, we have a chance. And uh, today we are still uh, uh, surviving in this 
uh, uh, Indonesia focus market and uh, continuously be the leaders in the market. I was going to ask you what kind of animal you are, but I guess Komodo dragon is uh, is about is is an excellent one. Um, could you just tell us in a bit more detail how you use the AI? Because um, I understand you you use that to predict the amount of demand that you're going to get, and that somehow manages to increase the efficiency of your logistics system. Is that is that right? So that's the plan for the next evolution. So to give a context today, Tokopedia, we do not have any uh, product that we sell directly. So it is a merchants network, these 5.5 million merchants. We also do not have our own logistic. We do not have our own uh, warehouse. So it is all our partners. So we are creating super ecosystem where um, give you a, 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 a fact that 97% district Every time there's a transaction happens in Tokopedia, when the merchants ship their product in the next 24 hours, the customer, there's a 65% orders already received in the same day or next day delivery. So my friends, uh, a couple of weeks ago, just uh, met with me. He said that, William, I just uh, spent a couple of weeks in the uh, US for holiday. And uh, as a non-Amazon Prime user, uh, in US, I buy any product, I would need to wait for three to four days. And uh, you spoil me because in Indonesia, I buy any product from Tokopedia, majority of product will, I will actually receive in the same day or next day. And why that can happen is because of that uh, network of merchants and network of logistic partners. So customer, when they purchase the product, they tend to prefer to buy from merchants nearby them uh, and uh, from logistic that can support same day or next day delivery. But how to increase this 65% to potentially 100%, and this is the biggest challenge that we can only solve using AI. So imagine if like we have a merchants in a remote area that he or she have a very unique products, and no other merchants have that products. Imagine if like we can build a smart warehouse across the country. Imagine if like we can do the demand prediction. We already know what customer want to buy before the customer buy, and we can give that demand prediction engine to every single of our merchants. So they can put the product in advance, uh, uh, rent a warehouse as um, uh, the space as um, just enough for, for their inventory for the next one week. And that is our vision. And that vision we need to build using AI. So uh, leveraging the uh, investment from Sobang Vision Fund and the vision to become AI first company we start to build this a smart warehouse across the country. Mm. But this is a new initiative. Right, very interesting. So um, let me just now um, have a dialogue with the three of you before we open for questions. Um, we'll leave about uh, 10, 15 minutes for questions um, uh, towards the end. So um, one of the, the big themes that I mentioned at the very beginning is the, the US-China trade war and whether or not this is having an effect on technology in the region, um, and whether or not any of you are seeing any change in the financing environment because of that, either in a, in a positive way, in other words, more money available, or in a negative way, in, in you know, less money. So um, I think, uh, Jason, perhaps, could you, could you take that one to start with? What's been your experience so far of, of this? Trans-Pacific tension. Um, yes, yeah, so, so the trade war have some um, in, impact on ourselves. So, uh, but it's not a big. Our sales, I think, is only ten percent from US, and uh, it will cause some some trouble to us. And uh, for on the on the founder side, yes. So actually, it's the so China have its own problem. Inside China, we have we have some problem need to solve. But in the same time, the trade war, so the two, so inside problem and outside problem all comes together. So this cause, yes, the Chinese economy have some kind of problem, and the VC fund is not active as as before, and everyone can be uh, will be very not uh, not be, uh, they don't want to take much risk. So the so the small company fundraising is very hard, but uh, some big companies, some, some top one company in different areas, I think this year can have more resources. 
Yeah, I see. So um, when it when it comes to the funding side of things, are you talking about international funds that are being more cautious towards China or Chinese funds or, or both? Uh, I mean, Chinese funds and. Uh, I, and I think the, the, there are a lot of international funds, uh, a lot of VC funds from uh, American have their Chinese branch. So in China, it's uh, I think it's um, easy, quite easy to find some uh, uh, Chinese fund and foreign fund. Mm -hmm. And and what's the situation with MakeBlock? I mean, uh, um, what what would you say you're valued at these days? And do you think you should have another funding round soon? Do you need more money, or or what's the situation? Yes, we uh, we may have we have the plan to make another fundraising maybe late this year, yeah. Because um, we expand our business, so before we focused in at uh, in school market, but now we uh, we expand our business to consumer market. So this means we need more funds on marketing, on uh, yeah. So I guess you'll be hoping that when uh, Mr. Trump goes to Osaka um, at the end of June <laughs> for the G20, he patches things up with China. Is, will that make a difference, do you think, to your ability to raise funds? So I think for us, because we are, we are the top one in steam education area, it's not very hard for us to raise the fund uh, from, uh, and uh, yeah, so, but but yeah, the environment. If the the trade war becoming good, the environment may be good. The whole country will have more confident. I think it, it will be easier. Right. And yeah. uh, and how's the the business going? I mean, you you mentioned you know some very impressive numbers uh, earlier on, like eight million users, etc. Um, are you still growing? And which parts of the world are you growing most in at the moment? Yes, we are we are still growing, especially in in China. Yeah, because the China's STEM education policies is uh, only start from 2016. Mm -hmm. So before 2016, our business is all come from out of China. But uh, we started to build our local sales teams in 2016. So with two years or three years, I think yeah, uh, we have a lot of increase. So I think it's, uh, in China, the, the increase is more than 50% area. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, the, the Chinese government, they Thanks to the trade war, you know, the government know the importance of uh, technology education. So the government are willing to put uh, more funds in, uh, in through to, to companies and uh, to education in tech te technology area. Right. And, yeah. and so you said you were in 25,000 schools. How many of those schools are in China? I think in China it's about uh, 6,000. Yeah, you expect Six that to, to seven increase thousand. very quickly. Yeah, now? yeah, yeah, very quickly. Because right. China, we have about forty, um, how to say, uh, four hundred, four hundred thousand schools. Uh, I mean, uh, K twelve schools. Yeah, so the coverage is still very uh, uh, small. Sure, sure. And uh, last question: um, When do you expect to be profitable? Uh, we have the plan to be profitable this year, but uh, at least next year. Right, okay, yeah. okay. Uh, so Nishikawa-san, turning to you, are you seeing, how's the funding situation for you um, or for Japan more, more generally? Do you ever have any trouble raising funds when you need to? Well, I don't find any difficulty at this moment with us, but the um, trade situation may give some ramification to the companies. Um, but at this moment, um, when I uh, raise funds among the Japanese company, I don't find any difficulties. Thinking about your future, I mean, do you think about the rest of Asia or you think about the rest of the world? I mean, it sounds to me like you've got some really interesting products that you're developing. When you're thinking about going to market, what's your calculation? Well, especially the cancer diagnosis. At this moment, uh, we try to get the customer here in Japan, but uh, next target will be United States. And uh, at the same time, we have to find a partner uh, to go abroad and uh, planning to do so. And uh, so 
development in Asia won't be that far into the future. William, turning to you uh, again on the funding picture, I mean, um, how is it in Southeast Asia? Are you being pursued by all kinds of funds all of the time? Are you having to turn people away? Or, or you know, are you, are you also looking potentially at, at new funding? I think we look at this very strategically. So we also pick very carefully about uh, who is in our cap table. So now we have a, a very few selective uh, uh, people in our cap table, a uh, party in our cap table. So Square Capital, uh, Sohbang Vision Fund, and Alibaba is a, uh, is a key shareholders today for Tokopedia. But of course, if like we can find a, a strategy or financial investors that believe in our vision and mission, and because we are focusing only in Indonesia market, at least for the next couple of years, um, but believe on our vision that we will go into one market but go very deep and evolve our business model into a super ecosystem approach, then <clears throat> we, we never close the door to that type of the investor. Right. Um, the, the other thing is that Alibaba is also an investor in Lazada. How does that work? I mean, I, is Lazada a direct competitor or, or not? Um, or maybe it's a future competitor, but how do you, how do you work through that? So I think Lazada is a more, it's, they started as a retail, online retail model. So it's actually uh, um, like Amazon or like JD in China. But then after the, the acquisition, they transformed to become more hybrid model. So Lazada is an Alibaba subsidiary company. Tokopedia is an Alibaba uh, investment company. So in uh, Tokopedia, we have a uh, balanced shareholders and uh, we are country focused. Lazada is a regional uh, uh, company. So business model is different. Um, um, uh, market is a different. I see. Um, could you speak a little bit more about, you know, the environment in the region of Southeast Asia? I mean, I said at the beginning that there's been a, a tenfold increase in the amount of uh, private equity and venture capital money going into Southeast Asia in the four, first four months of the year. Um, do you perceive that? I mean, does it feel like money is very easy to get? And uh, I guess that the next question is, do you see that there is a kind of transformation underway in Southeast Asia? I mean, what you described with 5.5 million um, of, you know, people who are on the Tokopedia um, platform turning into small businesses seems to me to be quite transformational. But could you just broaden that out and make a comment about the, uh, the region? Yeah, I think the way that we should see Southeast Asia, um, a lot of like, from the financial perspective, see this as a, just a one uh, country or one region, but it is not. It is a one region with a, a very rich, uh, uh, different and uh, diverse culture, country, and so on. So this Asia, like, if like, we compare, it's like East Asia, we have China, Korea, Japan, um, depends on the business model. Certain business model can expand very well regionally, but certain business model like uh, e-commerce, for example. It is a highly operation. You need to solve local problem on the payment, logistic. You need to build the merchant's network. You need to build network effect. You don't see, for example, Rakuten in Japan actually uh, try to focus in China as a globalization strategy, um, uh, as a focus area. You don't see Alibaba is actually like uh, focusing on Korean market, for example. But you start to see that each of the country have uh, this uh, homegrown, homegrown uh, uh, champion for this uh, uh, very local uh, business model. So I would predict that Southeast Asia will, will also be like that. Today, um, Indonesia, the Thailand, Vietnam, this is all having a potential of a big, large population and a youth demography. And um, the, the reasons why the investment flow is going to Southeast Asia is like, if you miss the wave of US, uh, China, and uh, India, then uh, Indonesia is the next larger population. And if you go to there, then it's a Southeast Asia as expansion region become some of our hypothetically uh, theory to ex expand to the next step. So are you beginning to see a lot more competition coming in? I mean, uh, yeah, competition is uh, starting ten years ago, so it's not a new thing. So it's uh, not okay. recently; it's uh, starting ten years right. ago. Right, but but I mentioned at the beginning that you know the seventeen thousand islands in Indonesia. I guess if you manage to crack the logistics of such a huge and diverse area then that becomes a barrier for the next guys who are coming in because they have to learn how to do it. And by the time you've, you've done it, you're ahead. 
that's the benefit of being Komodo in the island. <laughs> okay, great. Well, um, let me um, open up for questions in, uh, in, in, in just a minute. Um, um, before, we, um, before we move on, could you also, William, could you um, tell us what your uh, plans are for expanding beyond Indonesia? Do you have any plans like that? So, uh, to my point of uh, East Asia as an example, when uh, maybe uh, both Amazon and uh, Alibaba go public, they have a um, globalization strategy and innovation evolution strategy. But we can see that their market cap today is a majority reflect from their um, evolution strategy. Amazon going to cloud businesses and, and so on and so on. Alibaba building China on it and so on and so on. Um, both still continuously try on the globalization, but uh, again, the globalization is actually a localization as well. Mm -hmm. right? So Amazon try in China and then they uh, uh, close the businesses and then they go to India. So it's a country focus. And it's a localization. When they pick the country, it goes to the localization. So it is not globalization as a, we launch a platform and then all people in the country on, uh, of the world can just enjoy. So Tokopedia, we can learn from that history. It's a time machine effect. We shouldn't uh, uh, repeat the same mistake. We have a limited resources. We raise a $1 billion. Guess what? Amazon is a $1 trillion company. So um, we need to use our resources very well. And to win on the war, you need to pick the battle Oh, very well, pick the battle that you can win, and eventually you can win the war. So for us, it's all about the evolution, and that, that's why the next 10 years vision, it is not to become the largest Southeast Asia e-commerce or whatever it is, it is to continuously be a technology company that help other people to become technology company with a core mission statement, how we can help democratize commerce to technology. And Indonesia alone, if like we see the uh, E-commerce uh, 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 market size, maybe it's not very big. It's a 3% to 5% of the GDP, which is 30 billion to 50 billion uh, uh, market size. But the economy itself is a $1 trillion economy. And Indonesia will grow to become $2 trillion economy, $5 trillion economy. If you are expanding your business to not only helping online businesses, but also helping traditional offline businesses, farmer, fishermen, you go very deep, then your market uh, uh, share is uh, no longer just this uh, 30 to 50 billion pie. Your market size growing to the potential $1 trillion economy. Right, absolutely. Um, so could we uh, um, open for questions now? If you'd uh, like to ask any of the panelists a question, could you put your hand up? And I think there'll be a microphone uh, hovering around. Um, uh, have we got, yes, we've got one over there in the middle and one here in the front, please. Um, so, oh, and one over there, uh, and another. So, um, could we go to the lady, please, in the front, first of all? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you to the speakers. This is really a remarkable and outstanding um, presentation about your businesses, and I feel very hopeful for uh, the startups, both in Japan and Asia. My question, um, to the speaker, especially to Mr. William, is uh, you mentioned that when you watch uh, Mr. Son talking about his 300 vision, uh, 300 years vision of the company. So my question for you is, what is your long-term vision for your company, and what do you think Tokopedia will be in the next 100 years? I'm sure that you have many business models that you have in your mind and calculations, and I'm sure it will become a very different company from what the company is today. So I want to hear your vision for the next at least 50 years of your company. <laughs> and for uh, Mr. Wang um, and for Mr. Nishikawa, since uh, your um, software and um, uh, your innovation is very broad and it can have a lot of implications in many different industries, my question to both of you is like, who are your future partners, what kind of companies or institutions you're hoping and planning to cooperate with. Thank you. So William, first of all, please. So um, I recently, uh, just a couple of days ago, met with Sonsan, and I actually said to him that I didn't bought enough to have 300 years vision yet. So I take a baby step, which is uh, the next 10 years vision. So which is uh, uh, today I, I said from the technology company that help other people to become e-commerce company. We want to become the next 10 years technology company that help other people to become technology company. But the mission statement is uh, to that point, we imagine that one day every single individual in Indonesia 
will have the same opportunity no matter where they live. Okay. Yeah. So um, our future partners, like, um, uh, so first the type of partner is a traditional education company. So they are doing uh, traditional uh, education content and they, uh, they have teachers, they, they, they can make curriculums. So, um, so these, m many of these companies, they are switching to a STEAM education company, and then they, they need to find some kind of hardware and software, so we can provide hardware and software to them, and they can make their own curriculum. So another type of company is like uh, some channel company. Like uh, uh, many school, uh, many companies, they have the channel, uh, have the connection with schools. So before they buy, they uh, sell other products to schools, but they, they can sell like some STEAM education product. Thank you. But to add on, I promise on Sun that if I can achieve my vision for the next 10 years, I'll make a boat uh, vision at least 100 years moving forward. So hopefully I can achieve that 10 years vision. <laughs> Maybe in the next year conference, I'll ask you again. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, with evolution of software, the software will develop together. And as for soft uh, hardware, the the, the software, in the case of software, software develops on the top of current software. There is some constraint at the result of current software. But people move freely. And uh, the two, uh, the leg, the walking is easy. But when it comes to machine, it's very difficult. The, the industrial robot for the accurate movement, uh, it is necessary to put weight in order to have uh, accurate walking. But with uh, cleverness of uh, the software, uh, I think the hardware uh, that can be manipulated more easily. So hardware uh, itself can operate more efficiently, accurately. So currently on the, uh, on the top of hardware, we put software. But we, in order to become the company to produce the hardware, I think we do need to have a closer collaboration of manufacturing company. So in other words, uh, uh, the border between software and uh, hardware should be eliminated in the future. In the middle there, um, just behind, uh, yep, just. Here, 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 here. Uh, my name is Murai Ishi, and AI is uh, almost beyond me, but so my question may be very amateurist and stupid. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, uh, Jason, uh, about two weeks ago I went to Beijing and uh, I attended the conference on dialogue of Asian civilizations. And after the conference, uh, we uh, invited some group, invited us to uh, Asian visual art exhibition. And I was very much impressed by your Chinese visual creativity, almost overwhelmed. So my question is very simple. And if it's not your personal secrecy or corporate secrecy, could you tell us something about what, how do you enhance your creativity? <laughs> well, do you have any special, do you read any special books or <laughs> you never read, read at all? <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Yes, yeah, so our business is to, uh, to help uh, children to uh, be more creativity. And uh, yeah, so for ourselves, we need to keep our creativity. So for myself, I, uh, I think the most important thing is to keep curiosity. Yeah, I feel, I, uh, I see a lot of things. I see, go to a lot of new city. I try to explore the new things, keep curiosity. Uh, curiosity, I think this is very, very important. And uh, another thing is, uh, willing to learn, keep learning. Yeah, you, you, I think that this is the two most important for, for most important uh, for, for myself. But for, for our company, I think in order to keep the whole company have the creativity. So we have uh, some kind of uh, activity called make a song. So make a song is a kind of uh, activity in our company that every year, every two months, we will hold this activity. So. We gather our people, so anyone without technology or without or in techno technology area, they can join a team. They will think about the idea, like uh, maybe for example, so 
uh, they, they want to build uh, some kind of robot to finish some kind of a task. So we have different kind of teams and uh, different people will combine with the uh, combined team and we have a, a small competition every two months. So we call it a marathon and uh, we, we hold more than 40 times of marathon during these years. I think this is a very important way to keep, the, keep active, keep creativity for the whole company. Thanks. Thank you very much. Xie Xie. Um, yes. And, and uh, just in front of, on that row, I think there was a gentleman in the middle. Would you like to ask a question? I think you had your hand up to start with. Yes, yes, thank you. And, uh, and after this gentleman, there was another one over there. Maybe we take these two questions together because that's the time we'll be running out after that. Well, thank you very much for very insightful presentation. I learned a great deal. Thank you. I have a question. First of all, to Nishikawa-san. I am managing a consultation companies, uh, Singapore, Philippines, and Shanghai. Uh, we have offices. So that uh, when we do business in Asia, uh, I have to learn things. So uh, that's why I'm listening to you here in this room. But uh, some of my clients using data uh, try to find a causal relation. And also, it is very difficult to define the requirements. So requirements of the definition. Each company, country has different idea. So US, Japan, you are working in different countries. So please tell us what's the difference in the requirement definition. I have a question to Jesse. So uh, education robot of STEAM. You have US, Hong Kong, Japan, and New Zealand, right? You have four offices. So why? You selected these four. Um, you are in Asia. There are many other cities. Why did you select these four cities? That's first question. And second question, even for other cities, if, well, even from Japan, can we get the uh, uh, materials? So that's second question. Next question, I think, uh, somewhere over there on that side of the room. Um, yes, there we go. Um, great, thanks. And I'm afraid this will have to be the last one. OK. Uh, thank you for your speech, and it was very interesting. And uh, I think my question is not as good as the previous one, and he's more challenging. Uh, what my, my question is for the Mr. Wang and the Mr. Nishikawa. Both of you are very special and very familiar with the robotic field. And uh, what? Can you tell us what do you think uh, are the new important technology we can improve to make the robotics better and the robotics field better in the near future in uh, both the software point of view and uh, in both the hardware point of view? Thank you. OK, so who would like to take the first question? Um, uh, William, are you OK with the first question, and then I think the second question was addressed to Jason and Nishikawa-san. Yeah. I think it's about, yeah, about, about yeah, Nishikawa-san. Right? OK, Nishikawa-san, yeah. I saw this, and you can... Well, as for the uh, uh, requirement definition, well, we have uh, been focusing on robotics, and uh, when we develop uh, robotics, uh, of course, the context is important. Cultural difference and the space of the rooms are different, and also uh, some of the uh, cultural differences. So even the same task, yes, the requirements are different. So how do we cope with that? What we have to do is reproduce that context so that uh, we really have to reproduce the uh, home uh, environment in each different country. That's what we do. And uh, when it comes to robotics, what would be the important technology to improve it? Um, critical technologies will be we have to control them real time. We have to change the control uh, scheme real time. At this moment, we are based on the traditional uh, management 
uh, control. But now we have to recognize the sensor information in real time and also reflect that in the uh, next action in milliseconds so that the control of robotics uh, should be created. Maybe reinforced learning uh, can be utilized to really uh, enable the uh, subseconds. And also end effector is important. Uh, end effector is hands. So uh, hands are not really precisely uh, manipulated as Japanese or, hu excuse me, human hand. So uh, we really have to come up with something to manipulate the hands of a robot much more minutely as humans. We uh, said this uh, different uh, uh, branch in different uh, countries is mainly depends on the importance of the market. Yeah, so uh, our so in Netherlands we we hope to cover uh, Europe. Europe is our biggest market, and uh, so in uh, in US is is sure it's big bigger market. And in Japan we think Japan have a very good potential. And um, uh, I know that the Japanese uh, government they have the plan to uh, promote steam education start from the year uh, 2020. And all maybe all Japanese schools they will start steam education in recent years. We think that is a very good potential, and we uh, so we hope that uh, uh, we, during this process we can make some contribution to to uh, Japanese uh, steam education because we have we have a lot of steam education experience, and in the same time we have relatively very good products for steam education. And right now, it's uh, sure it's possible to buy us from uh, uh, in in buy product, make product products in Japan. We have cooperation uh, 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 cooperation with uh, like SoftBank or. Uh, Kenny's some uh, uh, retail market, uh, retail channel, or some education channel. We we have partners here, and um, yeah, another question is like uh, uh, so the technology in robotics area. So uh, I think that yeah, it's uh, both in hardware and the software. We need more. We need a very good motors, very strong batteries, uh, very uh, sensitive sensors, and uh, on the software side, we need. We need AI. We need very strong eyes, very intelligent eyes, and uh, uh, very uh, very good brain. But um, uh, I think that one thing I, I'm actually regarding to AI. I'm my, I myself is a little worried about the AI may cause some problem because AI is uh, actually is very powerful. It's increasing very fast. Um, but uh, but uh, how to use AI? Because AI is so strong. It's like a actually it's like a like a weapon. If you you use in a in a uh, how to say in a good way, they will cause good uh, uh, results. But if someone use it in in another way, we can't imagine the the results. So AI is so strong. I think in the same time we benefit from AI, and we need to think about yeah, what can we do to uh, maybe we we need some laws or rules like to uh, to restrict AI in the same time. So um, we've gone slightly over time, I'm afraid. But uh, just before we uh, finish, could I uh, just mention one thing? Um, this week, there, uh, Nikkei journalists won uh, the top award in Asia for uh, journalism on technology uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, that happened uh, just, I think, uh, two days ago. And uh, all of those three journalists are writing for the Tech Scroll Asia. So please, um, it, it really is a, a very cutting edge product. And so please do visit uh, the table out there in the coffee break in just a minute. But for the moment, let me say a really huge thank you to our three wonderful panelists for what I thought was a fascinating uh, panel. So let's put our hands together and show our warm appreciation. Panelists, Thank you so very much. So please see them off with a big round of applause.
を本日ご紹介したニュースレター。